Ladies and gentlemen, folks and goats, welcome to the Command Valley for our first ever patron exclusive and featured game. If you are joining us for the first time, then please remember that this episode and this podcast is sponsored by Game Grid. If you are looking for any of the cards in any of these decks, then feel free to head on over to the link in the description box below where you can get those cards delivered directly to your house. Another reminder that this show and this podcast is brought to you by you and our fellow patrons at patreon.com slash command valley. Consider joining up today, checking out all of our tiers, and get access to exclusive benefits such as playing as a patron in one of our patron games. Now, this is the first time that we've done something like this, so we welcome you, and we will describe exactly how it's going to go. We have four players playing in this game, two of which are our own Command Valley members, Peter and Kogan, one that you might not have seen before. The other two are Command Valley patrons signed up for our highest tier. Let's introduce those players first. <clears throat> Our first Patreon guest is Matt, and he is playing Garuda Doom of Deaths. This deck wants to reanimate lots of even costing creatures and does a lot of self mill as well as milling out opponents to hopefully get some value off of their boards as well. He also has a lot of clone effects so that he can reanimate clones and clone Garuda, repeating the effect over and over again. Lots of chaining effects in his Demir deck. Our second Patreon guest is Austin, who is playing Atraxa Praetor's Voice. This is Super Friends, and this is the same deck that I built for a previous episode of Duel of the Peaks. You can, you can check out a deck tech in the description below for this deck, because it's basically the same deck with some minor upgrades from Kaldheim and the newer sets. If you haven't seen that before, the goal of this deck is to play lots of Planeswalkers and play effects like Doubling Season to double the counters as they enter, and then get lots of ultimate abilities off, get lots of emblems, just dominate the board that way. Next is myself. I am playing Svela Ice Shaper. This is a Gruel Artifact combo deck, which is not something you see every day. Uh, it has a lot of artifacts, it has a lot of combos, and mostly I'm aiming to win by getting infinite mana and casting my entire library using Svela. So that is the goal of my deck, and it's a lot of fun. And last but not least is Kogan. He's one of our other editors at Command Valley, and he is playing Shulane Teller of Tales. You've all seen the Shulane deck. It's Bant good stuff, but also just playing lots of creatures, lots of lands, and getting lots of benefits from playing bounce effects and other things to return creatures to hand and then play them again to get more lands and really burn through his deck really quickly. We've got a very exciting game for you today. Every player is bringing in a spicy, different strategy to the table. So the way that this is going to work is Peter here will be doing the play-by-plays and I, Griffin, will be doing the side-by-side -side commentary. Now, without further ado, let's begin the game. Matt starts us off. He plays a Swamp and then passes to Austin. Austin plays a Hollowed Fountain tapped, not paying the two life, and passes to Peter. Peter plays a Buried Ruin and passes to Kogan. And Kogan plays a Hollowed Fountain tapped as well, not paying the two life, and passes. Matt starts turn two playing an untapped watery grave. He takes two to shock it in. He then pays two for a demonic tutor, searching up a card and putting it into his hand. A demonic tutor on turn two is a very scary card to see. You don't know what your opponents are playing, and you just have to think about what they're going to grab from their library to put into their hand on turn two. Austin, on his turn, plays an overgrown tomb, also tapped, and he passes. And Kogan will play a Sun Petal Grove untapped because he controls the planes. He will then pay two for Growth Spiral, drawing a card and playing a planes from his hand. He will then pass to Matt. Matt starts his turn. He pays one for a Soul Ring and passes. And I can confirm that that is exactly what he tutored for with Demonic Tutor. That's what I was wondering, because if you have an opponent that casts a Demonic Tutor and the next turn plays a Soul Ring, I mean... The signs are all there. They probably search for that soul ring. So that's not the scariest thing that could happen, but it seems Matt really needs to get that mana to get his commander going, get that loop started. So that soul ring might have been the best thing that he could grab. Yeah, definitely. And soul rings accelerate you by two turns, yeah, basically, two turns. with, with mean, the yeah, mana. Maybe. So it's worth it to go and grab that, even if it takes a whole turn. Austin plays a command tower on his turn. He will then tap three to play Narset, Parter of Veils. He activates her minus two ability, looking at the top four cards of the library, getting a non-creature card from among them into his hand. He 
he selects Tamio the Moon Sage and puts it into his hand. What a turn by Austin. Some of the best Planeswalkers that you get in your Planeswalker deck. He's got Narsa on the battlefield, tick down to get Tamio the Moon Sage into his hand. If any of you have played against the Tamio the Moon Sage, you know if that ultimate goes off, it is extremely hard to deal with. And just the synergy and the the it will just overrun you over the course of the game. So that's a very powerful turn by Austin. Peter plays a Mountain on his turn. He will pay one for a Soul Ring. Then he will pay two for a Gruel Signet, and then he will pay three to cast his commander, Svela Ice Shaper. That's a powerful turn. You got two ramp pieces and your commander onto the battlefield. That, I mean, you can just see that as kind of a time walk, being able to jump ahead to cast that commander plus ramp. Very powerful. Well done, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Kogan plays a Planes on his turn, and then he taps three for Chromatic Lantern. That will fix all of his mana, and it will also tap for a mana. Matt starts his turn. He taps two for a Mind Stone, clearly still ramping, and passes. He's getting all the ramp that he can. His commander costs six. There's not a lot of ramp in blue and black, so he's casting all the mana ramp that he can in the form of artifacts. Austin, on his turn, plays an... Uh, Oxotic Orchard. Oxotic. Oxotic. Austin on his turn plays an Exotic Orchard, then he pays four to cast his commander, Atraxa. He passes, and at his end step, he proliferates, putting a counter on Narset. Just super powerful with Narset being able to tick up and proliferate those Planeswalker counters. That can be very scary, especially since we know he has a Tamio of the Moon Sage in his hand. So the players have got to start prepping, they've got to start dealing with this soon. Yeah, and that attracts it on turn four, having the right mana at the right time. That's really, really killer. Very powerful. Peter, on his turn, will just pay four for a Sword of the Perunes, one of his combo pieces, and passes. On Kogan's turn, he will pay five to cast his commander, Shalane Teller of Tales. Unfortunately, a little bit nerfed because of that Narset on the battlefield not being able to draw many more cards. I think Gogan is the most incentivized here to be able to deal with that Narset since Tulane allows him to draw cards and put lands onto the battlefield, but because of Narset, that ability will not let him draw that card since it's the second one he's drawn that turn. Matt starts his turn. He pays four for a Nightmare Shepherd, which will save his things from dying in the form of making tokens of them. This is this is very powerful in Matt's deck because the way that it works, Matt is trying to combo by getting Garuda onto the battlefield, milling clone copies that he can make clones of Garuda. But with the Nightmare Shepherd out, those clones will die due to the legendary roll and make copies of the clones, which will enter as Garuda again. So it's doubling up those triggers. That is a very important piece of Matt's plan. Austin goes to his turn, he plays an island, and then he will pay five for a doubling season. Holy cow, there it is. That is the most powerful thing that you can get in, in any Planeswalker deck and in many decks themselves. So to see that doubling season come onto the battlefield, knowing that he has a Tamiyo in his hand, that must have been terrifying. Uh, Peter will respond to the doubling season cast by tapping his commander to make an icy manolith, and that's it. Uh, he... Austin then goes to combat. He swings a Traxa at Peter. Peter will take four, and Austin will gain four from the lifelink. He then down ticks Narset to grab an Ajani Mentor of Heroes from the top four, and then he passes, and at his end step, he'll proliferate, but because of that doubling season, he'll put twice as many counters on Narset. There we go. It's doing work already. Honestly, if I was at the table, I wouldn't even be worried about a Trax at this point. I would just be worried there is a doubling season. I don't care that he's getting two counters from the proliferate, but once he plays a Planeswalker down, then he's going to be able to ultimate it immediately because of the doubling season. So that's very terrifying. The players have got to come together and deal with that doubling season. Absolutely. Peter goes to his turn. He taps six for a mana reflection, which will double all of the mana produced by permanence he controls. He then taps his soul ring for four, and then he uses three of it to tap his commander and make an icy mana lith. He then taps the mana lith and uses the one floating mana to equip the Sword of the Prunes to Svela. I mean, I love everything you're doing on your turn, Peter. There's a lot of uh, powerful plays, doubling your mana, creating more mana less, attaching Svela with the Sword of the Prunes. Like, the combo is, is getting there, but just nothing to deal with the, the doubling season. I have to admit, it's not a strong suit of that deck. <laughs> Kogan goes to his turn, he will tap 5 for a Future Sight, which lets him play with the top card of his library revealed, and he can play that card, so that kind of helps him get around the Narset handicap that he's under right yeah, now. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's halftime. 
All right, well, let's kind of talk about the game here because it's only turn six. We're about to hit turn six and already things are really starting to bubble up. Matt's got his pieces set together to start that combo that kind of comes out of nowhere with, with Garuda. Peter has set up his combo pieces in a, in a very nice manner, has that mana reflection out, which puts him in a very strong position in the game. Yeah. But honestly, with that doubling season on the Super Friends field, Austin is just kind of holding a ticking time bomb over everyone's head. Absolutely. And we know how many Planeswalkers are in his hand. We know that he's been getting a lot out of the top. And, and so every every turn that passes and Austin's board isn't being dealt with is another turn closer to death. Yeah. Closer to the end of the game. Absolutely. So let us know in the comments below what you think about this game, which deck you're rooting for, and what you think about the doubling season. We definitely need to get rid of that, don't we? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to remind everybody while we're in halftime, please go ahead and like this video, subscribe to our channel. This is the first time we're doing a Patreon game, so it's very new content. But if you'd like to check out our other content, including our gameplays, our Duel of the Peak seasons, right now we're on season two, go ahead and click on our YouTube channel and check out those videos. Also, if you haven't already, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash command valley. Consider joining up one of our tiers. If you do join up at our highest tier, you will have access to these games, which will be coming on to our YouTube channel. So thank you to Matt and Austin for signing up at that tier. We congratulate them for getting there. Moving back on to the game. Matt starts his turn, taps two for a Dream Devourer, and then pays two to foretell a card and passes. No one has dealt with that. Uh no one's dealt with the, the doubling season, so we know the Tamiyo's in his hand, so I'll bet you anything that Tamiyo's coming out unless there's something worse. Absolutely. Austin goes to his turn, plays an island, and then he will tap five for the Tamiyo, the Moon Sage. There it is. It comes in with double counters, and then that's enough to activate her ultimate, giving her, himself an emblem that gives him no maximum hand size, and cards going into his graveyard from anywhere are put into his hand. Now, that may not seem like a terrible thing, uh, to have that emblem out. But the thing is, like I said, the the attrition battle that you're going to have to fight with this emblem is very hard. It's an uphill battle, even if it doesn't seem that hard. And we'll see over the course of this game how impactful that is for Austin. He then pays one for a soul ring, and then he activates Narset to get Ashiok Dream Render off of the top four. Another very powerful very Planeswalker one. ability there. He goes to combat, swinging a track set at Kogan for four. He takes it, going down four, and he gains four. Now, the thing at this point, what's really, really sad about that emblem is if any players had a plan to remove that, any of the Planeswalkers, any of the, the you know, the doubling season, it's just going to go back into his hand unless it is exiled. So now the hoops are even harder to jump through. So at this point, Austin is just running ahead of this battle. Yeah. Austin goes to the end of his turn and proliferates. Peter will start his turn. He will play a forest as his land for turn. He will then pay six mana to tap Svela, activating her and getting an icy manolith, and then untapping her using the Sword of the Perunes. He then pays three mana for Rhythm of the Wild, and then pays five mana for Koldotha Forge Master. Rhythm of the Wild will trigger when Koldotha Forge Master is cast, and and Peter chooses for it to gain haste. He then floats some mana and then taps Koldotha Forge Master to sacrifice his mana rocks and finds an illusionist bracers from his library and puts it onto the battlefield. He then uses two of that floating mana to equip the bracers to Svela and then three more mana to cast Blasting Station. He uses the rest of his mana to tap Svela and make two more icy manaliths and passes the turn. You know, I honestly, I really love this turn, Peter. It's very, very impactful in the way that you're setting up yourself for a combo win, but it didn't quite get there. So I think that play kind of falls flat because there's there, you haven't finished the combo, you haven't won the game, and nobody's affected Austin at this point. So how, how are you feeling at this point? Before I say anything, I'm realizing that I probably could have comboed off there. Because if I had two untapped Icy Manoliths and Svela were... No, Svela would have been tapped. That would be the problem. Because if Svela were untapped, I could have comboed. Because what I would have done is tapped two Icy Manoliths for four mana, tap Svela for three, make two more Icy Manoliths. So you were very close. I was I was close. Now, I don't think it would have quite worked like that. 
but it, it is a fact that you were very close to I was yeah I was I was very close to comboing off of course you know I can't do anything about this attracts a board but I my my best hope here is that I can get there I think if I can I can survive one more turn I can I can get to the the comboing point and yep, that's what we have to hope for we just have to hope that Austin doesn't have anything scary in his hand that will just end the game on his turn yep. absolutely Kogan goes to his turn. He plays an island from the top of his library. He then plays Tatiova from the top of his library. Shalane triggers, but nothing happens because of the Narset. <laughs> he then passes the turn to Matt. Matt is clearly struggling for blue. Yes, he's, he's really struggling. All the, re the removal and interaction he has in his hand is blue, but he doesn't have the blue mana to do it. Yeah, he's only got one blue mana, and he needs at least two for all of the stuff that's in his hand. So he's really struggling there. He, we were talking about his mana struggles earlier, and this is just compounding on that, that he doesn't have the right colors. Right. He will, however, pay six for Garuda. He... When Garuda enters, everyone will mill four cards, but when Austin mills, those four cards going into the graveyard will go straight to his hand because of the Tamiyo emblem. He then reanimates Burning Rune Demon from his own graveyard, then searches his library for an island and a dark water catacombs. Austin will choose which one will go to his hand and which one will go to his graveyard. Austin chooses the island to go to his hand, and the dark water catacombs goes to the graveyard. Matt then goes to combat, swinging Nightmare Shepherd at Austin for four, and Austin will take it, not choosing to sacrifice his commander. Well, that is something against Austin, but I don't think that's quite enough. I don't, I don't think it's going to be enough, no. It's sad to see that Matt was struggling with that blue mana and also not able to get a clone copy of Garuda to be able to cycle through. And also the fact that that Tamiyo Emblem is allowing Austin to draw four cards every time that happens, that's very scary. We don't want Austin to be drawing more cards. It's just a very scary place to be in. Yeah. Austin goes to his turn. He plays a Karn's Bastion as his land for turn. He then down ticks Narset to get a Chain Veil off the top of the library. <laughs> so good. He then pays six for Vraska Relic Seeker, which enters with enough counters to activate her ultimate, taking Peter down to one life. That is that card, the one that we were all scared of, with those Planeswalkers, if you can get those ultimates off as soon as they got onto the battlefield, you know that's going to be a haymaking play. Those emblems and those ultimates are not supposed to be played at the turn they come out. There's a reason why they take multiple turns to get there. And Vraska is one of those ones that that ultimate just absolutely changes the game. Yeah, absolutely. And there are so many different avenues in that deck to get to something like this, where you could do Soren Markov, you could do uh, Liliana, uh, the, the Dreadhorde. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many ways to get this absolutely insane effect. Those Planeswalker ultimates, they're very scary. Austin will then go to combat and swing Atraxa at Peter. Peter will respond by tapping his Blasting Station to sacrifice Fella to deal one spite damage back at Austin, and then he takes the rest of the damage and he is out of the game. You know, to power play, you should have just dealt that damage to yourself. <laughs> then you wouldn't have been alive. I'm just saying. Yeah, good point. <laughs> but rip in peace, Peter. That was very sad to see you go. I can tell, and Austin could tell, that you were definitely in the second commanding position, that you had your pieces almost there together. It was sad to see that it didn't come out on that last turn. Very, very close, but no dice. So does, it was a very good play by Austin to take you out first. Yeah, and I think uh, the main reason was that I did, I couldn't block his attract set. I think that's why he targeted me, not because I was about to combo off, but, you know, it was, it was, also, it was very sad. Very I, I, I was almost there. I was about to do it, but now we only have two players left to, to try and deal with uh, deal with Austin. But it doesn't seem like it's getting any better at this point. Yeah, taken out by my own, my own attractor deck. It's not the worst way to go. I mean, it's just props to you, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I guess so. The deck, so. I guess it's so. A yeah. Pseudo win for you. But Austin's also playing really, really well. So Austin is doing fantastic. Austin goes to his second main phase. He pays three for a Flux Channeler, which will proliferate any time he casts a non-creature spell. He then passes, and at his end step, Atraxa triggers, double proliferates again. 
Kogan goes to his turn, he plays a Plains from the top of his library. He then taps seven for Diluvian Primordial. This will let him cast an instant or sorcery from each opponent's graveyard. Austin doesn't have a graveyard, so he casts the Demonic Tutor from Matt's graveyard. He searches his library for a card and he puts it into his hand. That's a very, very important play. It's very sad that he wasn't able to cast anything after using that Demonic Tutor. Uh, but finding anything into his hand, that means he's going to be able to take something at least to get rid of maybe the, the I don't know at this point. I feel like it's probably going to be the doubling season. But so far ahead with all these Planeswalkers, it's hard to see what you need to get rid of. Yeah, absolutely. Matt goes to his turn and he will go straight into combat. He swings the Burning Rune Demon and Nightmare Shepherd at Austin for 10. And Austin will take it. Matt will then cast a Foretold Flood of Tears to return all non-land permanents to their owner's hand. From the second part of Flood of Tears, he will put Garuda back onto the battlefield. And when Garuda enters the battlefield, it will trigger, milling each player for four, getting a Noxious Gear Hulk from his graveyard. And since there aren't any other creatures on the battlefield other than Garuda, he chooses not to destroy anything. This is a very interesting play by Matt. I mean, this does help get rid of all those Planeswalkers in the, in the doubling season by putting him back into his hand. So it slows down. It's a very tempo play. But now we have that Vraska Relic Seeker that's back in his hand. I mean, that's it's, it's scary. It's very scary. We have to get, we have to do something to be able to get rid of Austin at this point. Otherwise, he's gonna he's gonna take over the game. Yeah. Anyone have an exile uh, target player's hand card? Well, that would around? be great. That would be that would be really nice right now. Matt continues playing a soul ring, and then he taps two to recast his dream devourer. He then passes and goes to discard. Austin, on his turn, plays a Swamp. He taps one to recast Soul Ring. He taps five to recast his Doubling Season, and then he taps four to recast his Commander, Atraxa. He passes, Atraxa triggers, but there's nothing to proliferate. So this is good. This is a this is a tempo play. Basically, Austin is one turn behind, having to play all of his stuff over again. So this gives a little bit of a window of opportunity for the other players to be able to deal with that Doubling Season before any of the other Planeswalkers hit the battlefield. Definitely. Kogan goes to his turn, taps three for a Chromatic Lantern. He then taps one for Finthorn Elves and taps three for Skute Swarm, which will trigger any time uh, land enters the battlefield. But out of mana, he passes and goes to discard. Matt goes to his turn. He plays an Island for turn, and then he goes to combat swinging Garuda and Noxious Gear Hulk at Austin for 11. Austin will take it, going down to 26. Definitely chipping his life away at this point. I mean, maybe if, for chance, if they get one more turn, then they might be able to just take Austin out the old-fashioned way by just dealing damage. He then taps two for Mindstone, and he taps four for a Thassa Deep Dwelling. That will let him, at his end step, exile Garuda and put it back onto the battlefield. When it enters, Kogan and Matt will mill four, and Austin will basically draw four. Matt returns a Solemn Simulacrum from his graveyard onto the battlefield, and then he grabs a land and puts it onto the battlefield. That's really sad for Matt. I mean, I could tell that he's really trying to get that engine going, get those clones uh, into his graveyard, and then onto the battlefield, start copying everything. Uh, but it just, he wasn't able, he whiffed a couple of times. I mean, he did get a Burning Rune Demon. That's a very good card, but just not, not enough. Yeah, get there. I think he needs more flyers. I think he needs a way to protect from that Vraska. If that, if that Vraska does come down and his life goes to one, he needs to be able to protect from the Atraxa attack afterwards. Absolutely. That's the only way you're going to survive that at this point. Austin goes to his turn. He plays an Interplanar Beacon, which will gain him a life anytime a Planeswalker enters the battlefield under his control. Come on, Austin. Everybody's already fighting uphill, and now you have a life gain. <laughs> Give him a chance, man. He then pays six for Vraska Relic Seeker, again, entering with double counters, and he gains one life from the Interplanar Beacon. He then activates her ultimate, reducing Matt's life down to one, exactly what I was talking about. He goes to combat, swinging Atraxa at Matt. Matt will respond with an Essence Flux, exiling and returning Garuda to the battlefield to trigger one last enter the battlefield effect to see if he can find a flyer or something to deal with that Atraxa. However, he whiffs on all creatures. No creatures are milled this way, and he just takes the damage That's and very, very sad. goes to zero. Rip in peace, Matt. Rip in peace, Matt. Your deck is probably one of my favorite decks. It's just so fun to watch it just loop over and over again, and it's very sad to see that it wasn't able to get looped. 
Um, just a bad luck on the draw. Wasn't able to get those clones, but you fought hard. Rip in peace, man. Rip in peace. All right, Austin's staring down only Kogan at this point. So Kogan is the last chance to be able to take out the Planeswalking Super Friends deck. Let's see how it goes. Austin will go to his second main. He will tap four for an Johnny Steadfast and gain one from the Interplanar Beacon. He will then activate Ajani's ultimate to get an emblem so that whenever damage is dealt to planeswalkers he controls, he prevents all but one of that damage. He then passes and double proliferates all of his planeswalkers. Double proliferates, double Kogan goes to what may be his last turn. He plays an island, which will trigger his Scute Swarm since he has six lands. He will get a copy of Scute Swarm. He then pays three for Intruder Alarm so that anytime a creature enters the battlefield, all creatures are untapped. He then pays five for Shulane Teller of Tails, which will trigger the Intruder Alarm and untap his Fintorn Elves. He taps two for a White Mane Lion, and this is a little bit of a loop that he has in his deck. He will, to pay for the White Mane Lion, he taps the Finhorn Elves for one of the mana, and then a land for the other one. He returns the White Mane... He returns the White Mane Lion to his hand. This, the, this sequence of events will trigger Intruder Alarm, untapping the Finhorn Elves, and trigger Chilane, letting him draw a card and play an island. And it will also trigger his Skeet Swarm, getting two more Skeet Swarms. So he will try to do this loop again. Taps two for a White Mane Lion, returns the White Mane Lion to his hand. Finhorn Elves will untap, and then he triggers Chilane, draws a card, but... He fails to put a land into play. He didn't draw his land that he needed. Yeah, that's 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 tough. I mean, this is a very interesting and very fragile kind of combo where you can just get those lands into play, recast the white main lane, bring it back. You loop through, get a lot of scoot swarms because he has scoot swarm, which is a very powerful card. But again, if you miss that land drop, then it all just stops right there. Absolutely. And what he really needs is flying right now. Exactly. He needs to get a flying blocker because he knows that rat. That he knows that, that rat. He knows that Vraska is is potentially going to be put on him again out of mana he passes over to austin austin plays a planes and then he taps six for a johnny unyielding gaining another life from the beacon he then he minus twos a johnny steadfast to put two loyalty counters on each of his planeswalkers and two plus one plus one counters on atraxa this will give a johnny unyielding enough loyalty counters to activate his minus nine which will give 10 counters to each other planeswalker and 10 counters to atraxa he then has enough counters on Vraska to activate her again making kogan's life total one he then goes to combat swings atraxa at kogan and this will take him out and austin is our winner austin is our victor congratulations austin that was a very very powerful last turn using those planeswalkers synergizing with each other those are johnny's which give your other planeswalkers uh counters and just kind of leveling up until you could get that Vraska back up to an ultimate that was incredibly powerful very well played yeah absolutely and i'm just going to jump straight into the card of the game, mvv card of the game with that doubling season it sitting there on the battlefield the whole game no no interaction to deal with it other than that flood of tears which it immediately came back you know that is a, the ultimate card to have on the battlefield for that for yeah for that super friends deck and i absolutely agree that will be the card of the game uh without that um doubling season it was going to be very hard for uh, austin to be able to get that quickly up into a commanding lead i mean both uh, everyone at the table just needed a couple more turns to do their thing but because of that doubling season it didn't give them enough time Absolutely. And Austin, he, he played everything in the right sequence. You know, he, he had just enough mana for Atraxa when it was right to cast Atraxa. Same with Narset. He had the right mana to cast Doubling Season the next turn. And then the next turn, he cast that uh, Tamiyo to, to seal the deal. And so there, everything fell into place for Austin. And he, he created a board state that was so hard to interact with and so hard to deal with at all. And he just ran away with the game. It definitely seemed like he was far ahead once that Tamiyo emblem was was created. So it was very impressionable that the other players were trying uh, to take Austin out, uh, but it didn't end up being enough, and Austin will take away this game. So congratulations, Austin, and also congratulations to all the other players. Well played and well done for playing your decks very, very well. 
Absolutely. It was a lot of fun, I, I have to say, to, to not only almost be able to do my thing and, and, you know, combo off and win, but also seeing uh, another one of the decks that I built, you know, in the hands of someone else, playing it better than I could have. So <laughs> It was very, very powerful. It was it was a lot of fun to play in this game, and and uh, congratulations, Austin. It congratulations, was a, Austin. It was well, Peter, the question I have for you is, what do you think was the, the play of the game? Um, I think the thing that tied everything together really was that, um, was the Tamiyo play. Yep. I, I think I, playing that at that moment, it hosed Garuda before it even got out. It, it made it impossible to take care of that doubling season. It really just... It locked up Austin's board from any sort of interaction that would have been impactful. I mean, we did get a flood of tears through and that didn't do enough he, yeah, he it returned one turn it was just one turn and then and then someone else died from the hand of raska again i yeah i'm gonna agree that tamio emblem is extremely extremely powerful like i'm saying even with garuda getting him to draw four cards every time he had a copy of garuda which is what matt's deck was meant to do that allowed austin to draw into his ajani's it allowed him to draw into the Vraskas and all the interaction that he would need to close off the game so i agree that that tamio play was definitely the play of the game but the question is, what do you think was the play of the game? What do you think was the card of the game? Let us know in the comments below. And again, thank you so much for joining us on our first ever Patreon featured gameplay video. If you would like to be on one of these gameplay videos, then head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash command valley. We have a ton of tiers that you could join, but to be a part of the Patreon games, you do have to sign up for the highest tier and there are only a limited number of those available. So sign up quickly and we'll see you on one of these games. Absolutely. Make sure you check out our Patreon. See what tier is right for you. We have a lot of fun on our Discord, especially with the Strixhaven pre-release season uh, just passing. We had so much conversation about the new commander decks and the, any new builds that we're building. Lots of things going on on the Discord. It's a lot of fun to be part of that community. So even if you can't be part of these games, we do play games with all of our patrons and it's it's a blast. It's a blast. But thank you for watching. Let us know in the comments below how you enjoyed this video and how you enjoyed this game. Let us know which deck that you would represent on your own Patreon game. And we will see you next time for our next gameplay or deck tech video. See thank you. Guys.